Thank you for kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my great honor, and I'm very uh, excited to be one of the speaker in this wonderful symposium. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate to Chinoin for this on its third year event. So uh, today, my talk is a role of acid suppression in acid-related disease. Uh, which is a PPI and PCAP. Uh, this is today uh, my content for role of acid suppression, uh, especially for in GERD. And first, I have to introduce some uh, study for PPI and new drug for PCAP. And final, I'm going to introduce uh, Notel, which is uh, produced by uh, Iliang uh, Pharmacy. So let's begin to, uh, for the GERD for epidemiology. You know the, the, the range of GERD prevalence is very wide. So North America and South America has a very high prevalence of GERD. And also uh, today, recently, the East Asia, uh, Korea or Japan, has a very high increasing uh, GERD prevalence. So we have many, many using PPI, and nowadays also PCAP. So I'm going to introduce some uh, short uh, South Korea uh, situation. Uh, in the beginning of the, until 2004, the prevalence of GERD is uh, about uh, below 5%. And after, since 2004, so double, like 80% uh, was in tr uh, uh, is a prevalence of a GERD. And now this may be uh, over 10%, like 15% is actual uh, prevalence of GERD in Korea right now. So you know that the symptom of GERD is a uh, main cause of heartburn and acid regurgitation. And usually regurgitation is a more dominant symptom in GERD. And especially in Korea, we have uh, some more dominant and like paraesophageal symptoms like chest discomfort or glove sensation, uh, hornness, like something like that. So uh, in compare with uh, regurgitation or heartburn sensation, the paraesophageal symptom is more uh, dominant in Korea. So the spectrum of GERD in the real world, you know that NERD is more dominant than uh, erosive esophagitis, and 5% uh, is maybe the complicated erosive reflux disease. But in Korea, we don't have much, uh, many cases like complication of reflux. Many patients has a more uh, high prevalence is like AD class A or B. So the suppression of gastric acid is uh, definitely PPI. So after uh, manufacture the PPI, so all the uh, previous uh, drug like H2 receptor antagonists was replaced by PPI. And let's talk about the history of gastric suppression. First, 1970, H2 receptor antagonist was published. And after 1990, the first Generation of PPI was uh, introduced like omeprazole, lansoprazole, and pantoprazole. And 2000 over 2000, second PPIs were introduced like rabeprazole, esmeprazole, and dexamethasole. And 2010, the third generation PPI, elaprazole, was launched. And nowadays, we can use the PCAP uh, like tagoprazole or, or bonoprazole right now. So let's begin with the proton pump inhibitor. So so George Sachs would, uh, was sensitized the first PPI omeprazole, and we have to understand the simple mechanism of PPI. Uh, like when we insert the PPI administration, accumulation of PPI in the parietal cell and irreversibly inhibit acid production. And active pumps are triggered by a meal, and PPI is inhibit only active pumps. So that's why we have to take the PPI those 30 or one, 30 minutes to one hour before the first meal of the day is recommended. And also PPI do not completely shut down acid secretion with single dose of PPI because the plasma half-life is one to two hours and proton pumps can continuously regenerate it. So daily or more frequent dosing may be needed to achieve optimal anti-secretory effect. So PPI only blocks activate proton pump as I told you. So this uh, period uh, are not blocked by one's PPI. So the goal
goal of treatment of GERD is uh, first, most important is a controllable symptom. And second is uh, preventing relapse of esophagitis. And third is uh, preventing long-term complication like stricture, ulceration, barrett fagus, and esophageal adenocarcinoma. In Asia, this kind of barrett and esophageal adenocarcinoma is not much high, but maybe some day over 10 or 20 years later, maybe our country like Korea or Japan maybe uh, goes up with complication of GERD. So everybody knows that continuous therapy with full or half dose BPI is effective in preventing GERD relapse compared with placebo. placebo. But so we have to use the maintain therapy, but how long do you have to need more and more than one or two years later? Uh, so we have to think about uh, continuous therapy versus non-continuous therapy. So there are three kind of uh, uh, method uh, about non-continuous maintained therapy, which is first intermittent therapy, like this is a take medication for a certain period after less of the symptoms. And on-demand therapy is uh, take medication only when symptoms occur. And threshold method is a gradually increase the interval between medication as long as the symptoms do not recur. But this kind of method has some limitation because as I told you, the PPI is a very, uh, half-life is very short. So slow onset of action on PPI, the efficacy is sometimes insufficient of this non-continuant maintenance therapy. So this schematic uh, figure shows that uh, first the continuous maintenance, and second is the w when the symptom occurs, we can use the PPI like intermittently in certain period. And on-demand method is uh, uh, take medication only when symptom occurs like this. Well, let me introduce uh, first uh, therapy, uh, maintain therapy like intermittent. This is study for designed by a PPI daily user versus PPI intermittent user versus placebo. And you can see that almost 50% completed study on intermittent therapy. Only 25% switched from intermittent to daily maintain therapy. That mean in the reflux symptom, in the re like, like re relapse or refractory GERD symptom, we can use the uh, switch to the continuous to the intermittent therapy like 50%. And second therapy is on-demand therapy. So this graph shows that the endoscopy rem remission was uh, the, a longer time remission in continuous therapy than on-demand therapy. So this study was uh, a study uh, designed by randomized control study to continue 243 versus on-demand 235 patient versus. And you can see that there's a difference between the endoscopy remission. But how about the symptom? Because uh, PPI is a main goal is a relief of the symptom. You can see that significantly more patients in the continuous group achieved re the symptom relief during two-thirds of the 24 weeks of maintenance therapy. But here is a, however, this difference disappeared in the last seven weeks. So we can assume that we do not have to uh, maintain therapy for continuously. So after, after three, I mean after seven weeks later, uh, like over two months, we can change the master light on demand therapy. So here's a uh, uh, summarize of the algorithm for tr treatment. So usually I treat the patient like first a uh, mild reflux symptom or a nerd patient or mild asphagite, erosive asphagite patient for about one month PPI. And after uh, check about the symptom, I use uh, usually on demand, I, I prefer on demand PPI. But the very severe erosive asphytitis and very severe reflux disease symptom, I usually uh, use a continuous or intermittent PPI. Okay, let's move on to refractory GERD because the refractory GERD is the main cause of using the maintenance or the long-term use for PPI. So what's the uh, definition of the refractory GERD? So this is a survey by uh, the, the doctor, or gastroenterologist, so you can see the it's about 70% a doctor answered the standard dose, a BID, for eight weeks, or a single dose for eight weeks. And uh, a real uh, definition of the refractory GERD is a persistent of GERD symptom after 
appropriate and correctly performed PPI treatment at standard dose. So in the Asia Pacific region, uh, region the, the definition of the referred guard is uh, at least eight weeks of a standard dose of PPI may be termed refractory guard symptom. So there's uh, many, many uh, the um, reason for uh, uh, developing refractory guard, like psychosocial comorbidity and a compliance of a PPI and functional heartburn and PPI bioavailability and the disease category like uh, eosinophilic aspagitis or the reflux uh, characteristic like weak acid or non-acid, uh, something like that. So there are a bunch of the factors that affecting the refractory guard symptom. So I'm going to talk about the three categories for the mechanism of PPI refractory. So first, the patient-related, and second is a diagnosis-related, and third, the therapy-related. So patient-related is uh, uh, for poor compliance for taking PPI, and also in appropriate dosing time. And diagnosis-related factor is a uh, neuron GERD, like just weakly acid or non-acid GERD. And therapy related is a nocturnal acid breakthrough or acid pocket or metabolic polymorphism. So patient related factor, first is a low compliance to PPI. So this is a very famous uh, table that showed that compliance only about 6% patient has a uh, follow that uh, the, the correct uh, uh, prescription uh, method. So in proper, in proper PPI dosing time is the most important thing. So you can see that there's a about 50%, only 50% uh, take PPI correctly. But another 50%, the rest of 50% do not uh, follow the, the exact dosing uh, time. So this is a very, uh, very important point that when we check the patient to refer to GERD symptom, we have to check first is the patient uh, take the medication for uh, properly. So poor compliance is a, one of the major cause of our PPI refractoriness. And also patient self discontinuation, self discontinuation once symptom get relieved is also one of the major uh, reason. So some uh, studies show that even the doctor advised patient improperly to take PPI like 70% of primary care physician, even if the gastroenterologist, 20% had, they do not uh, uh, explain the PPI the properly. So this is a main, very important first step to check the uh, PPI compliance to the patient. Second is a diagnosis related uh, factor like non-GERD or the weekly or non-acid non GERD. This study shows that 172 patients with persistent symptom on the list twice daily, but the patient has a typical symptom. So typical symptom patient is like about 50% as non as association. And atypical symptom patient has a 20% as a non as related uh, GERD symptom. So this is why only the PPI is the not main uh, weapon to control the refractory GERD symptom. And also, the very difficult thing is uh, the GERD is a very disease, wide disease spectrum. Like erosive asphyxitis or NERD patient, their acid exposure is much dominant. But when you think about reflux hypersensitivity, like normal asphyxitis acid exposure, but positive symptom association for acid or non-acid reflux, or the heart functional heartburn, like normal asphyxitis acid exposure and negative symptom association, uh, probability that is a more high sensitivity of asphagia sensitivity is a more dominant. So that's why we have to think about uh, why the PPI do not work for or only for the only the powerful weapon. And this study shows a very good study for uh, representing the, the the hypersensitivity and functional heartburn like. Even the thir I mean, 30, thir over 312 patients with uh, heartburn without asphagitis, 155 patients is a non responder like symptom relief is below 50%. And if you check this patient with uh, pH uh, uh, modulator, uh, modality, 
So 35% has a hypersensitive asphagus, and, and, and about 50% has a functional heartburn. So very high rate of a uh, 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 hypersensitivity factor is uh, involved in PPI non-responder. So there's a various cause of non GERD. So not a real, real uh, reflux disease like achalasia or eosinophilic esophagitis or like gastroparesis. We have to think about this kind of a category. And some studies show that prescription for PPI do not have an appropriate indication like 40 to 65 percent. So if, even if you use the PPI but the patient getting worse symptoms, we have to think about that kind of non GERD, like a cholesterol or motility disorder. A third is therapy related. So this therapy related has a, a main cause of the refractory PPI is a nocturnal acid breakthrough. So NAB, NAB is the presence of gastric pH below uh, four for at least one hour during the night time. So this in period, many people have some troublesome symptom at night. So some uh, in Asia Pacific survey, 94% of PPI treated patients have some breakthrough symptom, and 62% of PPI treated patients have experienced breakthrough symptom at night, and 23 patients of PPI treated GERD suffer do not get a good night's sleep. So how about treatment for the, the NAB for adding H2 receptor antagonist? But this graphs show that the limitation of the adding H2 receptor antagonist uh, is, a, is a tolerance. So this study shows that uh, even use the PPI, PI therapy, the NAB percent is very high. So adding H2 blocker at night, the symptom get very well, well controlled. But after one week later, the symptom cannot uh, relief by only using H adding H2 receptor blocker because the, the, this drug has a tolerance. So the conventional first or second PPI have short plasma half-lives. So that's why once daily PPI are unable to control nocturnal reflux symptom. So how about using adding uh, PPI uh, BID for control the better clinical outcome? You can see that this uh, the graph show that uh, if you use the BID, we can control the nocturnal heartburn. But uh, the, the key point is this in this graph has shown that only half those BPI, BID is can uh, control the reflux and nocturnal acid breakthrough with uh, the same as the 20, gram, 20 milligram of BID. So I usually prefer the split dose, not that double dose. So when the patient has a refractory GERD symptom or Heartburn at night, I uh, usually uh, split the, the half dose or B, half dose like 10, 10 milligram or BID uh, prescription is I prefer method. And third is a genetic polymorphism of a COIP2C19. So you know that the lower efficacy of PPI is in extensive metabolizer, and the poor metabolizer has a more um, uh, high rate of a uh, uh, control of relieving uh, GERD symptom. So this uh, study shows that the plasma PPI is uh, very high in uh, poor uh, uh, metabolizer compared to the extensive metabolizer. Also, cure rate is high rate in poor metabolizer. And when we divide a not cure and cure group, the cure group has more has a uh, plasma PPI. So the limitation of the first or second generation PPI is a uh, uh, 2C19 polymorphism by uh, PPI. So what's the requirement acid suppression agent in 21st century? First, the regulism acid breakthrough and not interfere of a meal and long duration and no interaction of other drugs and fast on that of action and constant therapeutic effect regardless of a CYP2C19 genotype. So do you have some, uh, have another drug for overcome this kind of limitation of uh, PPI? We have to, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce some uh, PCAP. So let's compare with, with the, between the two drugs. Uh, the PPI is a conversion to reactive from uh, uh, reactive form and reversible binding 
to the external surface of the active pump and need to stimulate a proton pump. And PCAP is directly bind to the uh, binding domain and resting and resting and stimulate state. And this uh, PCAP is a reversible binding, so no need to stimulate proton pump. That's why more stable in acid environment is possible, and the rapid and strong and continuous gastric suppression is more uh, 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 dominant uh, compared to the PPI. So PCAB is a uh, started development in 1980, but the development failure due to hepatotoxicity was repeated as administration of uh, linaprazan. And 2007, Rebaprazan launched in Korea, but withdrawn from uh, market due to the hepatic toxicity. And after uh, eight years, uh, Vonaprazan from Japan launched, and uh, two years ago, Tegaprazan approver, uh, approver uh, launched in Korea with a, a Korean company. So the unmet medical need for PPI was conventional PPI is a delayed onset. Like as I told you, that delayed onset maximum efficacy at three to five days uh, were required. So this uh, graph shows that uh, day one and compared to day five, there is a uh, intragas pH is a difference. So when we when the patient using the conventional PPI, uh, the PPI should be dosing uh, daily, like at least three days. But the PCAP, that's very fast on so like within a 30 minute to one hour, it reaches uh, uh, above the pH level of four. And even even after seven day, the also same effect sustained. So PCAP, the main advantage of a PCAP is a fast onset. So that's why uh, using the uh, conventional PPI, four or five days of daily dosing is required for exerting full efficacy. But the, when we're using the PCAP, immediate full potency from the first day of treatment. Like, so that makes uh, enable uh, on-demand use like refractory or symptom patient or emergency therapy. Another uh, PPI unmet medical needs is a wide inter-individual variation of PPI's uh, drug response. So all PPIs are metabolized via uh, mainly 2C19 due to structure similarity. And the polymorphism can increase individual variation in response to PPI. So this, uh, show, this graph shows that the, the systemic exposure to PPI as expressed by AUC is about five to 12 times higher in polymorphism than in extensive metabolizer. So that's the kind of a variation make some refractiveness for regard even if they try to using double dose, uh, dose up the PPI. But the PCAP has a low drug, drug interaction and individual variation because mainly metabolized by uh, CYP3A4 rather than 2C19 and less DDI potential with clinical drug metabolized by CYP. So like we can, uh, there's no very low uh, potential with DDI like uh, with the clopidogrel. Another advantage with uh, using PCAB is uh, uh, no food e effect. So this graph shows that tegaprazon with the KPAP and esmeprazole, the fasting status and, uh, and bird, uh, feeding state there were big difference in esmeprazole. But tegaprazon, there is uh, not much difference. And this, this table shows also the, there's no uh, very high this difference between the, the, uh, the fasting condition uh, and fading condition in median pH level. So PCAP is a superior and acid, superior and acid suppression. Like note, you can see that this graph says no tachyphylaxis or delayed PD through repeating doses. So that's why we can use a PCAP like uh, in the, even if the, the patient do not symptom relief using the conventional PPI like doctor exit per through. So in, in use of this kind of patient with a PCAP, so that's why we can overcome the ex nocturnal acid breakthrough using the PPI. So if you use uh, the PCAP, like this kind of acid breakthrough time, you can control the NAB con uh, symptom, uh, like more potent and more longer uh, duration for acid suppression in using uh, PCAP. So how about the clinical uh, outcome? 
So this study shows that healing rate of asphagitis, there's no difference between using the PCAB or PPI. But when you're focusing on the, the more severe uh, subgroup, like RA class C or D, we can uh, check out the PCAB as more high potent to uh, heal the asphagitis. This table also shows that, in, uh, the study showed in, the, in, in, in Japan, you can see the difference between in the LA class C or D and recurrence in 24 weeks like uh, in severe uh, reflux categories. So let's uh, compare the PPI and PCAP. So PCAP has a more rapid uh, onset and higher acid secretion suppression effect and no or minimal inhibitory potential and no significant influence by C2 9, C2, uh, 2C19 and there is no foodie impact. So final topic is uh, Noltec, which is uh, Elaprazole, manufactured by Iliang. So this PPI is uh, developed over uh, nine to 2010, and third generation PPI. Uh, this study shows that there are many uh, study that PK and PD and safety study for Elaprazole versus Esmeprazole. And you can check that uh, Noltec is, uh, has a plasma half-life is three times more prolonged than uh, Esmeprazole. It has a higher AUC level. And also, Elaprazole shows better PD effect. So greater degree of intragas pH in regurgitation, uh, regulation effect than Esmeprazole. And this, uh, until now, there's no competitive study conducted between Elaprazole and Tegoprazan, but Based on the indirect comparison, we can see in graph that in the 12th hour after dosing, lepros tend to have a higher percentage in intragus pH over four level compared to tegaprazone. Another advantage is the uh, effect of 2C19 genetic polymorphism and no individual variability. This study is uh, 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 conducted, performed in the Korean and comparing the homogeneous extensive metabolizer and heterogenic extensive metabolizer and poly metabolizer. And the results show that no individual variability between these kind of three categories patient. And many studies show that the elaprazole and riaprazole show relatively small difference in PK and PD and clinical efficacy among the different uh, 2C19 genotype. So that's the elaprazole has the least effect on uh, genetic more polymorphism compared to conventional uh, PPI like omeprazole, lansoprazole. And also, Elaprazole metabolites are uh, really involved in uh, 2C19, or like other PPI. So major patho ma metabolic pathway of elaprazole is non-enzymatic. So that's why uh, the PK uh, uh, drug, drug interaction is not high. So this study also shows that the PK drug interaction and safety after co-administration of, of antibiotics. And this study shows that the changes were not statistically significantly significant. So this is a summary uh, of the, the P elaprazole, uh, the very uh, low affinity to CYP, to CYP uh, isoenzymes and low metabolites dependent to CYP2 CNA, and little or no inhibitor effects, uh, CYP3A4. Uh, so in conclusion, the low possibility of inhibition difference in drug efficacy and drug interaction. And also, how about the safety? So now it is very, there are lots of uh, uh, paper the concern of the PPI, and, the, and the one of the cause uh, factor, uh, whatever some factor is a uh, uh, high level of uh, gastrin level. But this study shows the plasma gastrin level did not uh, increase it proportionally with increasing the erapalazole dose. And, and also gastrin level declined substantially 24 hours after the fifth erapalazole dose. And regardless of the regimen administration, Plasma gastrin level returned to the near baseline level of five days after the last administration of a study drug. So, so, but this kind of study is very limited, so we have to uh, more data to say about the safety of a PPI or elaprazole. So, let's summarize uh, uh, my talk. The first general PPI, like uh, omeprazole, pantoprazole, lansoprazole, has a slow effect and difficult to control between four hour and nighttime gastric suppression. And second generation PPI has a developed to overcome this limitation of first generation. And third generation Elaprazole has a less dependent on uh, CYP2C19. And half-life is longer, and onset time is uh, faster. 
So that pairs is the only third generation PPI that overcomes the limitation of a currently available PPIs and has strengths over half-life and genetic poly polymorphism compared to uh, previous uh, PPIs. Okay, this is uh, my last slide. And thank you for your kind attention. And I'd like to wish all the best to you and your family for in, in this uh, pandemic situation. And I wish all you you have a good luck. Uh, thank you again. Bye.